Well, thank you. Uh, that was very nice. Um, I'm excited to talk about this because it's really kind of talks about my experience and the culmination of where I've been able to get through over the years. I'm Curtis Peary. Um, I am a general surgeon. I did not do an MIS or bariatric fellowship, but started doing bariatrics because of a need in 2010. I'm located in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Um, and I think this is going to be a very exciting topic and uh, how to get lean. I think Dr. Salzberg and I will really complement each other, uh, basically talking about our own experience with a few uh, um, differences that have been no noted between us. And um, like I said, it should be quite complimentary. So in about 2004, I started doing robotics. And at that point in time, the equipment was considerably different. Um, one of the big things um, that um, I've noticed over time is that I had the mindset of a lot of surgeons had. And I would really say that my experience at the beginning was pretty typical of that. And it can be frustrating, and I almost fell out. But um, then I um, had some resources. Um, subsequently, I was able to kind of learn from other surgeons. And I really embraced the technology because it had significantly improved. Here's actually me originally in 2004 on one of the standard systems. That's where uh, why I was first trained. And now I've seen kind of the entire evolution. And to me, it's quite remarkable um, where we were and where we are now. Um, what I mean by resources is that at that point in time, I did not really have um, anybody that could tell me to do specific things. Uh, you just kind of had to figure it out on your own. Um, and nowadays, you really have a plethora of uh, resources available to you. Uh, surgical societies will have hands-on courses and video libraries you can go and visit. Industry has significantly improved. An example of that is the intuitive ecosystem, which um, there's courses that you go to, almost like college-level courses in which on your level of experience of which courses you'll take. Um, but then also, I think us as surgeons have been able to embrace social media and develop these closed groups. And I'm very proud to be part of this um, closed group robotic bariatric collaboration. I think it's uh, really adding a lot to a lot of people's experiences and really accelerating their ability to do a high level bariatric surgery. And within that group, you'll, if you uh, are new to it, you know, you'll see us uh, surgeons will put in videos, whether they're very experienced or just starting, and we can discuss those. Okay, um, different members will ask uh, questions. We can do polls. Um, and then we've also been able to do like data collaboration. So it's, it's very comprehensive. I think one of the greatest things about this is that you'll see a surgeon. There's many ways to skin the cat on these surgeries, and you can identify someone who specifically um, has an approach that you appreciate. You know, a lot of us do not use staple line reinforcements, but there's a big need um, uh, or perception of a need um, by many people, and we want to um, be able to respect that and give them the resource that you the resources that you really need for that. One of the things I'd really encourage surgeons to do, though, is when you're starting out, please record your surgeries. It's pretty clear uh, in the literature that if you do video self-review or even go over videos of your surgeries with a mentor, um, you can really accelerate your learning curve. So, I, I, and I do mean that I'm going to show you how I became lean in bariatric surgery. It's a process, um, but when I show you my video, it doesn't necessarily mean that I expect that that is the only way to do it. Um, but it's more of an, ex it gives you an example of things you can do. And more of the talk is really that process of how to get to where you need to be to um, start getting lean. So first off, I'd really like to address the question of why robotic sleeve gastrectomy um, should even be considered. A lot of people feel that it can't be cost effective. They also feel that they already do that at a very high level and they couldn't possibly improve upon it. I greatly encourage people who are starting to do robotics start and in, in bariatrics start with a sleeve. It will teach you a lot of things. You know, it provides you that really strong foundation because it, you can gain experience with trocar placement and how the equipment works, um, and you can develop team dynamics and really then you subsequently develop your efficiency. Starting with a sleeve allows you, if your final goal is to be doing revisional surgery, allows you to break apart that learning curve so it's less frustrating and essentially safer and more uh, better care for the patient. Another reason um, to, to, for sleeve gastrectomy is the precision. I do believe that it gives you some additional capabilities that may be beneficial to you, maybe not all the time, uh, but there's times where you have a difficult sleeve that I feel that um, I did benefit by having um, um, the platform there. I also like to have the integrated technology. I don't need to have 
um, uh, you know, a energy source for a, a vessel sealer moved into the room. It's all really incorporated into one single system. The nice thing about the XI system is that as things are updated and within since 2000. 18, there's been new instruments and a new stapler and new uh, vessel sealer and an energy, an energy source for this vessel sealer and upgrades in Firefly. So I've really feel that it's the XI has been the platform that's benefited me the most and will continue uh, likely uh, for quite a while, I believe. I hope so anyway. Um, don't forget er ergonomics. You know, I personally have been starting to have some shoulder issues and I can tell you right now, um, I'd be really struggling if I uh, was not on the da Vinci surgical system. And finally, I do believe it can be economic. We're starting to see this uh, even as recently as Dr. Um, Elshar's um, article uh, in 2020 um, kind of shows that uh, uh, bariatrics can be um, yeah, at least equivalent, if not more cost effective. So it all comes down to this. And when you're trying to really develop, uh, you know, an economic fast, um, inexpensive bariatric surgery. There really is a process that Dr. Thomas Swope, who is a um, super user, has been around for quite a while, and it kind of gets to the heart of the matter, and, and it's really good advice. First off, you know, get good. We don't want you to skimp on instrumentation because you just really want to, right from the get-go, show your administration you can do an inexpensive. We want you to use the instruments and the best instruments in your hand at that point in time to get a good quality surgery. As you um, and as you do that, then you're going to start getting faster, and then finally you can look at um, how you can uh, decrease some expense. So how do you get good? This comes down to a lot of things. The first off means you know getting experience, but it is very very clear to me um, that it takes frequent touches to get through the learning curve quickly. And what do I mean by that? This table here that you see is really from uh, uh, robotic hernia data, but those surgeons who went through their learning curve the quickest because of the highest volumes, even from the get-go, had operative times that were significantly um, uh, shorter uh, than those that were in the bottom 90th, that were in the 90th percentile and lower. How do you get, and then getting fast? Well, of course, that. Frequent, that is going to come from experience. Once again, frequent touches will get you there quicker, but also developing team dynamics. And, and I say when you get started with this, you really want to have a team that's invested in you and a small team so that you can really go, grow together. Because there is a lot of difference in, in how you communicate and do things when you're sitting at the council, you're not immediately at the bedside. But you can overcome those when you develop that culture with your team. Also, be open to doing things in a different way. There's sometimes some inherent inefficiencies that I see surgeons do, and maybe you're gonna want to continue to do that, but keep an open mind about how other people do, and I do that all the time. I A lot of things that you see me do, I'm not the person that first did that. I, I, I steal those things. I'm not bashful about it at all. I, I want to put out my experience, and when people put out theirs to me, I'm very willing to learn from them. And getting cheap, how do you get cheap? First off, you get lean. What you can start to do when you get that experience and you know how to do things, then you can start looking at your instrumentation and critically think about, do I really need this instrument? Or would this instrument kind of replace two others? And that is a process that may be trial and error over time, but I've been able to do that and I'll show you with the sleeve how I was able to get down significantly. Also, rely or at least trust in the technology. There are, um, this is different equipment than what you've had before. A robotic system isn't meant to be replicate a laparoscopic surgery. There's inherent differences, and if you don't utilize the technology um, to its best effort, um, you're not going to really recognize the benefit. You're not going to recognize that you can significantly do a better job um, with it. The other thing is, um, surgical the robotic instrumentation is uh, becoming less expensive. Uh, there is a program out there called the Extended Lives Program that Intuitive is automatically going to enroll surgeons in. Uh, that process is going to start in November. They're able to give me this data, and as you can see here, they gave me a long list, but I just put three of these on here, the procedures of bypass sleeve and then perisophageal hernia. And with that Extended Lives Program, which essentially works by, you know, they looked at the original instrumentation and say it was um, useful for, they would have 10 lives. Well, now they've extended that about 10%. And so when you purchase that instrumentation, you essentially are saving, you know, for a 
Uh, my bypass is since with extended lives about $250. Um, and this is what the price is for uh, the, at least the robotic uh, instrument when I do the surgery. So somewhere between $250 uh, to $196 uh, for the surgeries that I've seen. Like I said, be open to change. Change is good. Uh, this is a trick that I picked up, um, I think, on, on uh, one of our closed groups. And what I'm using is the Visigy tube, and I'm injecting ICG and a saline mixture in it. Um, ICG is very inexpensive. The, the, the Visigy tube's already in place, and here you see actually a positive leak. It was a very minor leak. Um, but that really keeps me from using uh, endoscope or other equipment, and I think it's a fast and effective way of doing things. So I think change is, uh, that was something that I can uh, picked up from others, and it was a change from what I previously did. So let's finally get down to um, what we're here to talk about um, is how um, to become lean with a sleeve. You know, first off, I got to talk about where I was at. Here you can see me using three instrumentation, three instruments. You, I have a needle driver, I have a bipolar fenestrated grasper, and then right down here I have a cotier. And so I think this is useful. Right away, what I did, this was my go-to trocar placement in which I had, I used all four arms. I had an, uh, an assistant that was always here. Um, I utilized that fourth arm greatly here for suturing. Um, the stapler that I used in this is the older staple, the, the, the 45 uh, stapler, which now we uh, use the sure form. And so this is kind of where I used to be. But then I really feel that over the last two or three years, that the, with the improvements in instrumentation, the improvements in the stapler, I was able to essentially revisit where I was at. So this continued innovation really has led to what I'm doing today. So this is the Sureform stapler. And what I'm doing right now is I got a white load finishing my sleeve. If you take a look right down here, you can see uh, that it's paused. The Sureform technology will read the thickness of the tissue a thousand times a second. And if it is too thick, it's going to pause and it won't fire those staples until the thickness is appropriate so you get a perfect deformation. I think to, for me, when I switched from one to the other, you could see previously on the sleeve, I would over sew that frequently. Here I don't. I can see I have nice dry staple lines using um, a strategy that I'll talk a little bit about later. Um, but I also have a lot of faith in it. And it's not only me that feels that um, um, that this is an improvement. There's a lot of other surgeons too. This is a poll that I did on RBC earlier. Um, I think it was just a month or two ago in which I asked the question is, has using the sure form changed um, what you do during a sleeve. Do you um, over sew anymore or do you use staple line reinforcement? And the answer was that um, prior to the sure form, about one out of five surgeons didn't over sew or use staple line reinforcement. But of, of those that did, essentially two out of three surgeons said, yeah, I went away from using staple line reinforcement. Or I went away <clears throat> from um, over sewing. And so when you see that, then what you're really doing is affecting change and um, and saving time and, and capital expense. So that is one of the big reasons why I feel that that um, robotic sleeves can be truly cost effective. And let me explain the economics of uh, the sure form stapler a little bit. With the old uh, 45, the smart clamp, that was a reusable staple that had about 50 fires, it cost $7,000. So each time you fired it, it was $140. The staple loads were 180. So essentially $320 per fire, and then there was a one-time chief fee. Uh, that was a one-time use. And so um, when I did sleeves, I was using seven to eight loads, and I simplified this just down to seven. If I used eight, then it would be a, even a bigger cost savings. Um, and so that essentially is $2,200. But when it came to the sure form, this is a disposable stapler that has 12 uh, fires within it, which is going to easily cover um, a sleeve. And so that instrument is $530 and the staple loads are 230. But when I started using it, I was only using an average of five to six, so about an average two less. And so looking at that, that math, you see that we're coming in essentially about $500 less expensive than it was earlier. But then there's other things that I also picked up over time, things that I came up with, but also just 
looking at the new instrumentation and seeing what I could do and pare down on. And so nowadays when I do a sleeve, I was using all four trocars and all four arms. So they, these are four drapes. I was also using assistant uh, trocar. So uh, in every case, I also used um, the vessel sealer. I also uh, used a Cotier and a bipolar fenestrated and then the stapler. Nowadays, I essentially uh, do not um, drape out one arm. I use four trocars. Where the fourth arm would normally drape out, I actually have a trocar in place. I can use that trocar if I feel I need it, either laparoscopically, so my assistant is there, or I um, uh, drape out the arm real quick and I can put a fourth arm there. So by doing that, I have one less trocar, I have one less drape, I'm using one less instrument, and so this is essentially the equipment that I use now. And this, one, once again, is what it looks like here. I, we, we actually place a Mayo stand cover over there, and since I'm using one less drape and grasper, we have a decreased cost. The vessel sealer stand, um, I, when I need to, and I need a needle driver, I don't need to pull one out. I can usually just use the vessel sealer um, uh, to drive the needle, so that saves me another $220. And, um, and I usually don't need to suture in the first place. Um, but then also the stapler, the $500 that you looked at. But what I did not, so when I take a look at this, it's about a thousand additional dollars of drug costs that I've been able to get rid of. And what I didn't um, really calculate was um, if you also got rid of the staple line reinforcement or over sewing the, uh, the decreased time or the decreased cost of the equipment. Okay. So here's the video. I'm just going to let this play out. Once again, I'm just using the four arms. As you can see, I usually staple through here or through here. Um, and I'm using uh, the camera uh, normally in uh, two or three. Um, I actually prefer in two. And here you can see how it goes. I got a Cotier. I got the vessel sealer extend. And as I come through this, and this is with the old energy source. Once again, the, the new um, E100 energy source for the vessel sealer. It has decreased my clamp time from six seconds to two, about two seconds. It is a vast improvement. I love it. Um, uh, this here is sped up, um, but you can see it's nice and effective and nice and dry. So I mobilize first distally. One of the reasons I mobilize distally, I also pull the, the Visigy tube back since it decompressed the stomach. But if I mobilize distally, then I can flop that stomach over um, more readily than if I did proximally, proximal first. And so here you see me going um, up steadily. My assistant will move in. This is actually the very first time we ever did this. And you can see there, she, she usually assists from the patient's right, but now she's on the left. And I can even help direct her. I show her where I want her to be. She moves right in and we keep on marching right up the greater curve. Here I am coming in along the hiatus here. Identifying that left cruise. I have to say I differ from a lot of surgeons. I'm fairly aggressive with them. Um, um, looking for a hiatal hernia, um, even if it's negative, I seem, it seems like I find uh, quite a few small defects, so I'm very aggressive. So I looked on this side, I didn't quite like what I saw, so I mobilized um, a little bit more. But then I went kind of back to my norm, and which is um, I, uh, liked, I do like to take a look from the right side also. Um, so here I am, I'm going to take down the fat pad from the hiatus a little bit and cross over to that right side. I feel this is a benefit because I can further extend the esophagus within the abdomen when I even find a small hiatal hernia. So once I'm satisfied that isn't there, then I go ahead and I move the visage tube down in, in position. I'm going to fire from arm one. I can identify my landing zone there along the, the, the angle of hiss. Now this is a little bit earlier in which I started with black loads. You can see here I always leave, I try to leave a gap right down here, to make sure that it thins out, but you can see here there's no pauses at all. 
I got to say that I rarely get a pause, if ever, with a black load. So now I've moved to using a green, and most of the time I rarely get a significant pause there or have to move up to a black. So here I am with the green, and you saw no pauses there at all. I got it, and I have to say that uh, these firings are quite a bit uh, quicker. So now I'm on green, then I move up to a blue. And you can see from here, a little bit of a pause, just making sure that I have the correct thickness, squeezing the fluid out of the tissue, and a very nice fire. In this case, I stayed with uh, blues. I'd say frequently anymore, I'm actually on this last load or even earlier, I might even be using a green. I like that because I find that it further improves my hemostasis. And that's one of the things that I feel is that a lot of us use the um, uh, staple line reinforcement for hemostasis, but if we're aggressive with downsizing our stapler, and what I feel is that we can um, get rid of it. Now here's my leak test with ICG and saline. I tell anesthesia through the Visage YouTube, they instill 120 cc's very rapidly. I'm just using the empty needle driver, excuse me, the empty stapler to compress my um, antrum so I get good distension. This is a very sensitive test. And if I, and this is just a demonstration that if I, I don't need a needle driver, I can just go ahead and utilize the um, vessel sealer as my needle driver. So I've only used the three instruments, the stapler, the cotier, and the vessel sealer to complete the study. Okay. So in conclusion, I do feel that a robotic sleeve gastrectomy can be cost effective. Um, I really do. Um, you, one big reason is because of the extended lives program, we're seeing a decreased cost of robotic instruments, but also because of the improvement in the instrumentation, particularly the stapler, but also the other instruments such as the vessel sealer, and now the E100 energy source greatly uh, has uh, um, made me faster during my cases. These instruments are also more versatile in, uh, many times, and so like the vessel sealer I use as a needle driver. Um, but I, I really, I personally feel that the high quality stapling, it allows me to be comfortable with this and really think about um, not over sewing, therefore saving time or not using staple and reinforcement and saving uh, money plus time on that. Um, one of the big reasons for this is that we have better resources and training and sharing our experiences um, that will shorten your learning curve. So be open to change, be open to new things, and uh, we can develop some pra best practices amongst, uh, amongst us. So anyway, thank you very much for uh, listening to me, and um, I believe that we'll be answering some questions shortly.